You're listening to WCOM LP 103.5 FM Carborough and Chapel Hill. It's a Tuesday, it's five o'clock, and that only means one thing. It's time for another round of Snarky Faith with your host, Stuart Deloney. This is a space where we irreverently wrestle through life, culture, and spirituality, all with our heads in the clouds, our tongues in our cheeks, our hearts in our sleeves, and our feet on the ground. At Snarky Face, the questions or even the answers are never the point. It's all about the conversation. So here's your host, Stuart Deloney. Well, good afternoon and welcome to another round of Snarky Faith Radio. I'm your host, Stuart Deloney. And this week, this week, here on Snarky Faith, uh, I've got something I think you're going to really enjoy. We're going to be sitting down and talking with Scott Shea about his new book. I, I think this is going to be an interesting twist on something that, um, that you're going to enjoy. That you're going to enjoy. Now, that being said, that being said, me front-loading the show like that is also going to tell you one thing. We don't have time for much of anything today, so we're going to be kind of boogieing through. We're going to be running through this hour. And... Uh, for those of you that may just be joining us for the first time, just want to tell you this, that you can catch this broadcast and other podcasts uh, from us here at Snarky Faith uh, at www.snarkyfaith.com. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter. Just look up Snarky Faith. And at the same time, if you have questions, if you have criticisms, if you want to call me a heretic or if you want to call me a saint, I don't really care. You can reach me at questions at Snarky faith.com. Now, you remember like two seconds ago when I said we're going to have to boogie through the show? We we're going to have to boogie and we're going to have to move through the show fairly fast today. So, without further ado, I bring to you the Christian Crazy of the Week, our conglomeration, our collection, our cornucopia of the insanity that is Christianity in the news. So, here we go. Claude Hammers. The Lord is my shepherd. He know what I want. All right. So first up, and I've got questions about this one. <laughs> I've got some questions about this one. Uh, this comes from an article over at uh, deadstate.org entitled, Christian missionaries who argued taxes are against the will of God are ordered to pay drum roll, please, $2.3 million in taxes. Yes, yes. And I'm going to quote from their article here. Again, so many questions here. Uh, and they said this, uh, this Wednesday, two Christian missionaries went before the Supreme Court of Tasmania for failing to pay around $930,000 in income taxes, along with other charges in 2017. The missionaries, Fanny, uh, Sure, Aldia, uh, Beerput, and Rememberus Cornelius Beerput, wonderful iconic names, um, argued that paying taxes goes against God's will. Yeah, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And this is this is this is what they were saying. Uh, as again, they represented themselves in court because you know it's always going to go well when they do that. They said this: We believe that the Constitution affirms. The fact that the Commonwealth resides within the jurisdiction of the law of the Almighty God. And the law of the Almighty God is supreme, is the supreme law of this land. Okay, so yeah, it, it's, it's really good if you're trying to use that as an argument in court, because we all know it's not going to go well for them. No, but my, okay, this in itself is humorous enough. One, what? Like, $2.3 million? We're getting, like, into, like, Joel Osteen-level, like, tax bills here. But what? Like, my bit larger question is, beyond the fact, $2.3 million, they're missionaries, for God's sakes. They're missionaries. They're missionaries, and they have a tax bill of $2.3 million. And I can make fun of them all day for trying to use the, mm, God, you know, we pray our ta- pay our taxes in prayer, so we don't need to pay. And, you know, I'm not going to even go into that crazy. My biggest issue is the fact of <laughs> missionaries? Missionaries, $2.3 million owed in taxes. Yeah, yeah. I've been a missionary before. And apparently I did it wrong. Because these folks are raking it in if they're having to pay this much in taxes. Wait, what? Yeah, that is insanity. That's why we're here in the Christian crazy. 
Yeah, that is just nuts with many more questions, but not enough time. So next up in the Christian crazy, you may enjoy some of this because it is nutty. I'm not even sure how to frame the craziness of this. So some of it, you're just going to have to listen and just kind of, yeah, yeah. But what we have here, what I'm giving you here is Glenn Beck, which again, Christian crazy, Glenn Beck. Sure, pull up a chair there, Glenn. So Glenn, Glenn wants to do something to renew America's covenant with God. So he is wanting to do an event in 2020 that is going to restore America's covenant with God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As and, and this is one of the things why we do the Christian crazy is because one of the things I've noticed within Christians, especially towards the uh, religious right, is that they continue to move closer and closer towards something that they would be terrified of. It's called being overly superstitious. They, they've they turned faith into this weird, like, superstitious, almost witchcraft kind of a thing to where, oh, no, we, we have fallen out of our covenant with God, so we must perform the ceremony. Perform the ceremony and cleanse ourselves so we can have a ceremony and God will renew his covenant with America. Because where is that anywhere in Scripture? Oh, right. Glenn Beck doesn't need a license to promote crazy. He's got a microphone for it. So go ahead and listen to some of this. I'll see how long I can tolerate him talking about this. But it just just kind of see if you can kind of hear and feel the craziness in this. Because my assumptions would be that if we feel like we are not right with God, let's just get right with God. We don't necessarily need Glenn Beck to be able to facilitate some sort of an oracle ceremony or... or <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what he wants to do. But go ahead, Glenn. Go ahead, Glenn. So uh, I told uh, Tim two months ago, a uh, month ago, I don't know when I told you, um, that uh, I was going to do something uh, big, uh, a restoring event next summer. And I have felt strongly that it is supposed to be a renewal of the covenant. Uh, and you immediately, and I said to you, I think you need to be there. You need to at least be on the, the board, if you will, to help shape it because we have to do it exactly right. We have to repeat Washington and Lincoln. We have to do it right. Um, and we as a people need to gather together and do it. Ooh, ooh, can I be there? Like, will there be like wailing and gnashing of teeth? Will there be, there be like sackcloth and ashes? Come on, what is this? Or are we just going to turn this into some sort of a rally cry for the RNC in... Really, Glenn? Really, Glenn? You're going to pull the religion card here to push forward your weird ideology? Wait, that's what you always do. Oh, sorry, sorry. Fool me once, fool me once. Go ahead and continue, Glenn. So next summer, we're going to do it. Um, there's a lot of stuff that has to happen in between to be able to get there. Um, but we as a people can renew the covenant, correct? Because it is about us. It's the people. It's the people, absolutely. You know, that actually, that last statement Glenn had was probably the most honest of it. And he said that it's about us. And we're going to be talking today with Scott Shea about uh, the sin of idolatry. And when Glenn's saying that, Glenn's saying, you know, it's really about me. It's about, me. not me, Stuart, but, you know, me, Glenn. Uh, it's about me. It's about me. This event is about me and my importance. And I shall be the one to make it right again with the Lord. Because Glenn is really, really big on kind of retelling history or reconstructing what happened in the past to create bizarre, weird narratives that fit his own worldview. <laughs> Don't believe me, because Glenn has more. Um, are we the only country besides Israel, right, that has the covenant? 
Um, and yeah, I believe so. I mean, th- th- these are two promised lands. There's, there's the only nations I know of that rolled out that literally rolled out that way. Right. Evidence, historical evidence, and their they, covenant land. And the pilgrims, they left Holland because uh, not. You know, I'm sure they'll make it someday about tulip allergies, but they they actually <laughs> left because it was not a a blessed land, right? It was not a coveted land. They left because God told them in their solemn assembly, go to that land and make of it a covenant land. I have a work to do there. Don't you just love revisionist history? You can make history tell you anything you want to. (laughs) But we also know from religious right that you can make the Bible tell you whatever you want to when you kind of go through and handpack and grab out little nuggets of theology to build up what you believe in. So yeah, Glenn, if anyone, if anyone really wants to have a rockin' summer next time, cancel your vacations. You want to go hang out with Glenn Beck as he renews the covenant so the world doesn't end. And because apparently America, America, America has a covenant. And I don't even really know completely what that means. And it's just, it's just crazy. But you know what's not crazy? So this is part of the Christian crazy, and it's a little bit of a tangent this week, but I just thought it was darn adorable. I thought this was so adorable. And this is actually a section where we're going to be talking about something real, something real that happened. And this comes to us from over at lithub.com. And the title of the article is The Oldest, The World's Oldest Surviving Letter by an Actual Christian and it contains a request for fish sauce. That's right, fish sauce. I love how real that is. They weren't talking about covenants. They weren't trying to make this whole thing all about them and about how important they were. It was about fish sauce. And it begins with, Greetings, my lord, my incomparable brother in Paulus. And then uh, I, Arrhenius, salute you, praying that all is well as possible with your life. Then he goes on to do this. He talks a little bit about just the day-to-day stuff. But I love this. This is in the last paragraph of this old letter that they found. But send me the fish liver sauce too. Whichever you think is good. Our Lady Mother as well and salutes you as well as your wives and sweetest children and our brothers and all people. Salute our brothers and all our people salute you. I pray that you fare well in the Lord. See, See, most of the faith... And and this is why I find things like this in in a certain weird way in my weird head. I kind of find it a little bit beautiful because the letters like this, now that we're finding this, and sorry, I just read you the letter, didn't even tell you how old it was. This, this is an old papyrus letter that dates back to 230 AD. Um, And we see this, we see that this is like faith in the nitty gritty of daily life. Faith in the nitty gritty of daily life to where we're able to reach out and do life with brothers and sisters. But we also, we need to know, we need to know the recipe of the fish sauce. So I like the plainness of life, the plainness of being able to kind of walk humbly with our Lord, as opposed to the big shows of fancy that Glenn Beck and others like to go after. No, no, these were humble people that just wanted to know the recipe for the fish sauce. And on a side note, I will tell you, uh, from many of my friends, my brothers and sisters over in China, they have told me that you should try. It's Lo Gen Ma sauce. And I will tell you, translates to old lady sauce or old grandmother sauce. That stuff is fantastic. So I greet you, brothers and sisters, and I will give you the recipe for some great old lady sauce. Lo Gen Ma. If you guys like to cook uh, Asian dishes and stuff, this is heck and hella tasty. I think you're going to like it. And you know what else you're going to like? My conversation with Scott Shea. My conversation with Scott Shea about his upcoming book. We're going to get into some of the nitty gritty and talk deeper about the sins of idolatry. Sounds like light fun stuff. Well, it may or may not be, but I think you're going to really enjoy Scott, what he has to say, and his new book. So here we go with Scott Shea. Well, I have the pleasure today of sitting down with Scott Shea. Now, Scott Shea is not a rabbi or a theological scholar per se. Um, He's the founder and chairman of Signature Bank in New York, 
Um, he also devotes his time to the Jewish community work and uh, as the son of a Holocaust survivor. Um, he's an author, um, and his first book, Getting Our Groove Back, How to Energize American Jewry, and now it's coming out, his new book, In Good Faith, Questioning Atheism and Religion, uh, where he is seeking to re-examine the relationship between faith, reason, ethics, and as I've been digging into the book so far, it's an honest take on how a modern person finds meaning and purpose in ancient text, um, kind of, so far, yeah. So welcome to the show, Scott. We, I'm, it is my pleasure to have you here. Stuart, it's a pleasure to be with you. Yeah. So, of course, Scott, you know that a people, when they're thinking about books about faith and about God, that they typically want to look towards the founder and chairman of a <laughs> bank <laughs> writing a book about faith, right? <laughs> so, yeah, they People were just saying, what, why, you know, at an asset liability committee, why aren't you writing a book about God? <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so, I mean, some of this book, as I'm going through this, it's, th this is a bit of your own journey. And so, you know, I kind of want to just set this thing up with saying, like, why, why this book? Why now? And what led you to write about this? So, that's a great question, because... I never actually expected to write this book. I wrote my first book that you mentioned, Getting Our Groove Back, and I met so many folks in the Jewish community who'd say, it's a great book, really enjoyed it, but why do you actually care if we Jews exist as a group in the future? You know, isn't all of this Jewish stuff, religious stuff, just to the tooth fairy, Santa Claus, and, 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 and clinging to... Uh, clinging to uh, obscure beliefs that we don't need to hold on to now as modern people. And in the broader community, as I started to have these conversations with colleagues, Christian, Muslim, and frankly, spiritual people and all, all sorts of folks, they would very much leave me with the sense that it was just not rational to believe in God. Either some people believed in God, but they felt, ah, I got to park my brain at the door to believe in God, and I'm willing to do that because somehow I feel it. And some people said, no, it's just it's just crazy. I'm not going to believe. Um, it is a tooth fairy in Santa Claus. And then there were a third group, and I, I counted myself as a part of this group, but people who believed that it's rational to believe in the God of the Bible. But no one was making that argument. I, I couldn't find, I, I, I read Richard Hawkins, Christopher Hitchens, Daniel Dennett, Sam Harris, Victor Stenger, um, James Kugel, and they, they wrote these great books on why God, you're frankly stupid to believe in God. And I, I couldn't find a good response that, that, that represented my camp, which is it's rational to believe in God. With all we know about science and the historicity of the Bible and indeed our sense of modern morality. So I made the decision to do the to 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 write the book, and I sort of talk about that a little bit in the very beginning and very end of the book. I didn't know it'd be five years of all of my free discretionary free time, but you know. Uh, you, I, I think you, you probably have the same sort of passions in that once you decide something's really important, you give your all to it. Mm -hmm. No, it is. And, and how, like, um, before we even, like, dive into a lot of the topics of the book, how, how did that process grow, stretch, or change you? Because you mentioned, like, this was a, it was a five-year process. Because this wasn't sim simply you were sitting down and writing, like, a memoir. This was you researching and speaking with different faith leaders from... Uh, a wide spectrum of communities as well, too. And so, how, yeah, how did that change and stretch you? So I, I quickly had the feeling just as I entered the, pro the, the, the process, which is that I didn't want this to be just a Jewish book. I mean, I, I, I have, st although I'm not a Jewish theologian, I do spend a significant amount of time studying Jewish text, and that, that's apparent from the book. But I thought, you know, we got to start from the basics. Does God, is it rational to believe in God? And there are plenty of Christians and, and Muslims who have thought about that. So I decided to try to reach a broad spectrum of Christians. So I interviewed six Christian leading theological thinkers, ranging from the Orthodox side to the, to the evangelical side. Um, and I 
and then I, I interviewed two Muslim faith um, leaders. And I, one thing that was great for me is that I really found that we were more on the same page than on different pages when it came to belief in God, when it came to what motivates our life, how do we get purpose? We have tremendously different definitions and, and, and ways of expressing our faith. But when the rubber meets the road and you need to make an ethical decision, I think all of the same eight faith leaders that I spoke to, I think we'd be on one, you know, on one page and making the same decision. And and I have to tell you, it was I've been in the presence because I'm Jewish, I've been in the presence of many rabbis, and I sort of felt like I was in in some cases in my life where I've had the privilege of being with with really tremendous rabbis of, of feeling like I was in the midst of a holy person. And I have to tell you, I felt that a number of times as well, where I felt like I was, it's hard to, it's hard to put it in words, but I felt like I was in a, the presence of holiness. And for me as, as a Jew, that was really, uh, you know, quite a, it was quite a positive experience and it opened up my mind to interfaith conversations about what unites us, not about what divides us. Mm-hmm. Because it is. It's, it seems like we're in a wor- world today where I think we've, we've gotten to a very tribalistic place, especially in, like, in Western thought or in American culture. We're very, very tribalistic, and, and really the way that we've learned to look across the spectrum of people has become what, what makes us different, what divides us. That's, it's almost like we're, we're, we look for that contrast, not we don't look for the commonality in things. And that, that was one of the things that, that first just that grabbed me when I was reading this was, was that openness that you were taking to this conversation. Because oftentimes when people write books, like you'd mentioned Hitchens, or even on the flip side within uh, religious authors that are, mm-hmm. uh, you know, apologetics that are trying to defend the faith, you, you end up kind of walking into the situation already with an axe to grind. Um, right. And, and it appeared, you know, as I was reading through this, you really kind of came into this with, with a bunch of questions and an open hand. Um, which, which usually is not the starting place for books like this, <laughs> um, which is right. why I've, I've really, I've really been enjoying my journey through this book. And, and one, one of your core components of this book is, is this deep dive into idolatry. And, and for the sake of conversation here today, can you kind of give us some like common words and a common definition of how you're defining idolatry? So that's really, you've, you've hit the nail on the head because, the, th- the, the the thing the, the one concept that unites us as believers, Christian, Muslim, Jew, is that the Bible came to make a revolution. And what was that revolution about? And if you don't get this, I don't think you can really get the Bible. Is because before the Bible, everything was idolatry. And the Bible makes it clear if you read the stories and give them an open ear. That what is idolatry? You know, we want to say idolatry is about bowing down to some statues or uh, going to a temple cult. But what the what what the what the Hebrew scriptures make really clear is that idolatry is a lot more pernicious. Idolatry is a set of lies about power. It's about ascribing super authority or super power to finite beings, people, of course, uh, ideologies natural processes or the like. And in in the old days and in those days also animals, but we don't, we don't think about that so much more anymore, but we, we have this almost profound need to, to find some idol, which, which will ascribe supernatural powers to. And so the God King Pharaoh, was able to throw, you know, order people to throw the Israelite baby boys into the Nile. Why did they do that? Because if the God King says that that's truth, then that's truth. So Pharaoh used the tropes of pageantry, poetry, temple cults, um, defining the truth, of course, also with a very strong army. In the same way, that we saw a catalog in the ninth in the 20th century of God King Pharaohs. 
Hitler, Pol Pot, Stalin, the Kim family, the Assad family. It goes on and on who use the same sort of tropes and pageantry and power and glory and song and convince people to do whatever they said was true, even though it didn't make any sense. And we are so susceptible to that. And that is what the Bible is saying. No, we're all brothers and sisters. The first wor- first words of the Bible are that all men and women are created in the image of God. We all have that spark of divinity. The, the Nazis said that people like my father and my father's family were vermin. They should be they should be quashed. Their life had no value. The Bible says that's wrong. And it and it gives people, I think, the courage to stand up to idolatry. And I think sadly, you talked about the tribalization that's going on. Unfortunately, even in today's day and age, we tend to look for our God King Pharaoh, and then whatever the God King Pharaoh says, we figure out why that's right. So these the issue of idolatry is with us and is as is as potent and as threatening as it ever was. And that's why I think that the message of the Bible is just as fresh and 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 and, and urgent. And I and I, I encourage people and the thing on this book tour that I've enjoyed the most is getting people to open the Bible. Because when I ask people, how many people have read the Bible in the last month? Most people, I get get to year or five years before Mm -hmm. I get a significant amount of hands raised. It is. It, it's an interesting thing too that that in in many ways, especially where we're at, and like with what you're you're encountering on your book tour, is that I think so often people have been, as much as people have been attracted to certain idols, they've also been turned off or hurt by certain idols, um, or certain power brokers in faith, and and it's interesting how those types of faith power brokers can end up turning people off of the actual message that defines the faiths that we're talking about now. And, and, so, and so it ends up leaving this weird distaste in people's mouths. And so they say, well, the Bible, that's, we know what that's a part of, right? Like, we understand that. And it couldn't be further from the truth. And, and, and I, I find it fascinating psychologically. And tell me if I'm right. Uh, it's almost like you were saying is that, that in, in many ways nowadays that we almost go searching for our idols. And then we have to reverse like, engineer whatever those idols are doing to somehow fit uh, and make sense to a belief system. Um, we kind of find that strongman purpose and then try to like, ah, how do I make this fit in my ideology? All right, we'll kind of do it. And it's, it's, it's backwards. Well, there's a couple of things. So let me give you, let me unpack what you're saying, because there's a lot of power in what you're saying. Let me give you an example that's mm-hmm. outside of religion. And then we'll go to religion because yeah. this is one that everybody can get. How did Harvey Weinstein, how did Charlie Rose, how did Eric Schneiderman, how did a whole Mac Law, Matt Lauer, how did a whole host of folks get away with abusing power? Remember, I defined idolatry as a set of lies about power authority. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because in their industries, in their companies, they were unquestioned and unquestionable. They set themselves up as idols. They recognized what they were doing. So if Charlie Rose did something, by definition, that was okay. And if you weren't Along that path, you were fired. Um, And people rose up from time to time to say something. But just like people who rose up against Pharaoh Hitler or Pol Pot or Kim today, uh, Kim Jong-un, they, you know, it's idolatry has a lot of power because it's backed up by real power of armies Mm -hmm. and corporate lawyers or whatever you want. And so it's not so easy to topple idolatry, you know, and that's what you, that's what we learn. Unfortunately, religious folks in some cases are po- folks who are idolaters in monotheistic cloth <laughs> or costume have learned the same lesson. I mean, if you can set yourself up as a soul spokesperson for God, you turn yourself into the idol and the way we Jews count it, the third commandment, I think it's two in Christianity, but the third commandment is don't take God's name in vain. What does that mean? It's not, you know, don't, you know, swear. It is that too, but that's the small point. That's again, like bowing down to idols. The big point is anytime you say God said this, and I know because I have a direct line to God, 
Don't pay attention to anybody else. You set up yourself. You give your invest, your, invest yourself with that authority. And if people believe in you, and we've seen, unfortunately, really bad times where mm-hmm. people have believed in religious leaders who lead them sadly astray. Well, they're not really they're not really religious leaders. They're self deifiers. I mean, they, 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 by virtue of saying that they speak for God, they deify themselves. And I understand why that's repugnant. And that's one of the, the, the good things that atheism calls out is self deification. And, and, you know, to question, well, what is really God? I've, I've had some encounters with, um, atheists and they, we can get into this if you like, but they totally confuse what we even talk about when we're talking about God. They create their own God and they say, well, this God doesn't work, but you know, I don't believe in a created God either. Mm-hmm. That's idolatry, a created God. Mm-hmm. No, that's, that, that, that's, that's fascinating. And so I'm going to, I'm actually going to hop to a further question because you just, you just tipped on that one too, that I, I was going to ask a little later in this, but speaking about this and before we even hop deeper into idolatry, um, you've done a lot of work speaking, you know, doing, uh, speaking with atheists. So yep. when on that regard of kind of what you were just mentioning here, so I, I want I want to hear from you. Like, where do atheists get it right, and where yep. do atheists get it wrong? Okay, that is an excellent question, um, because I think there are some things that atheists get right, <laughs> mm-hmm. and I think we have to respect that. And um, and I think it's interesting. One of the folks that I read in the Jewish world, Rabbi Avram Cook, said, "You know, we have to thank God for atheists because they rid mm-hmm. us of idolatry." And he really, he was writing in the 1920s and he was so right. It, you know, idolaters can be cleansers of idolatry. So here's what they get wrong. Idolater, I, um, here's what atheists get wrong. They conflate idolatry and monotheism. They don't get the difference. So that's how Christopher Hitchens can say that Stalin was a religious person and Hitler was a religious person. That, and, 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 you know, a, a whole bunch of other examples that they take because what they don't get is that these folks have made themselves into idols. And I'm as against idolatry and idolatrous leaders as anybody. They then say, okay, because Hitler spoke to the Vatican and because Stalin you know, had a relationship with the Russian Orthodox Church, therefore religion is bad. And they conflate that and they, they get that wrong. They also get wrong. They say, we're going to test for God. And here's how we're going to measure it. We're going to do tests on intercessors, intercessory prayer, or we're going to do some other test. And they create their own God, and then they disprove them. But I don't believe, as I said before, I don't believe in a created God either. So it's sort of besides the point. What I think some of the atheists, so I think there are two kinds of atheists. There's atheists who believe in the common humanity of all people. And they believe in essentially the golden rule. Don't do unto others as you don't want done to you. And you know what? I can make common cause with those folks because even though they don't express it that way, they're essentially recognizing the common, I call it the common divine spark in all humans. They would call it just the divine, a, a, a human spark in all humans that we all share. Okay, I can, I can make common cause with you. The, the, uh, the atheists I can't make common cause with, and there are tons of them, and I talk a little bit about Peter Singer, who I give him a lot of respect because he's taken the atheist ideas and he has created a logical philosophy around it. But so is Dawkins and so is others, which is to say, and Yuval Harari, I don't know if any of your listeners have read any of his books, one of which I've reviewed. Um, uh, he does this as well, which is to say, look, I'm human. Um this is just all a random chance that I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm alive and that this universe exists here. I just want to get and do what's best for me. Actually, I don't care about anybody else. I just want what's best for me, my family, maybe. Um, and that's actually a self deification. It sounds Machiavellian. Machiavelli essentially wrote the same thing a few centuries ago, which is, you know, talking about how you amass power, how you look good, but not necessarily be good. But once that the only thing that's important is you, then that's how you get to saying, well, as Peter Singer does, it would be better for society if we 
didn't provide any special care for young infants. And indeed, if they have diseases that are going to cost society money, just kill them. Um, same thing with old people. You know, why are we spending all this societal resources on old people? Just kill them. There's no there's no divine spark there. Are they useful? Are they useful to me? Are they useful to society? If they're not, then get rid of them. By the way, that's sort of what Hitler's medical ethics mm -hmm. read like. And that's not that very different than what Stalin's um, doctrines were. Not useful. You're out. Um, you're not out. You're dead. <laughs> And mm -hmm. idolaters, it's the same thing. You know, if you're not part of Pharaoh's party, if you're not part of whatever I'm doing, you're out, you're dead. You don't have any value in the world. It's very easy for atheism to morph into that. That's how Marxism morphed into that. Mm -hmm. um, and fascism in many different ways morphed into that. The trick is, and the test for us folks who believe in God is not falling down that primrose path mm -hmm. and saying, no, even though this isn't good for me, that other person has a, has a divine spark. And even though I don't agree with him, I need to talk to him. Mm -hmm. It's not that he's unconvincible and he's not worthy of being convinced. He's my brother. He's my sister. Mm -hmm. And that's how you get the, the, the cornerstone of compassion. Mm -hmm. And that's what monotheism is really all about in the end compassion and respect for each other so on the flip side then because you were just giving us a narrative on what atheists get right and wrong what in in from your from your journey here what have you seen where the religious uh what do they get right and what did they miss out on too what do they get wrong so i think that the bible is a fantastic and wonderful book that was written, um, that's divinely, uh, divinely, divinely authored. But I think sometimes we try to read it so differently than folks read it three, you know, two and 3000 years ago. You know, mm -hmm. the, I think the first 11 chapters, for example, of the Bible are written to give us important, critical messages about humanity and about what we ought to do. Mm -hmm. But, you know, a thousand years ago, not quite, not quite a thousand years ago, Rabbi Yitzhak Avako was saying, you know, the world was created 15.3 billion years ago. And Maimonides was saying, um, well, I don't know, but the world was really, really old. A million, you know, million, he didn't, they didn't have the terminology, the vocabulary, but really, really old, you know, millions if they, you know, had those words. Um, and Avicenna said the same thing. Augustine of Oregon said the same thing. Um, Augustine of Alexandria said the same thing. He said the world's the you know the world is very very old. Um, they weren't so hung up on the literalism of the first chapters of the Bible because if you had spoken to someone twenty five hundred years ago and you had said okay here's the equation here's how it happens here's the equals mc squared. Mm -hmm. here's quantum mechanics, here's, mm -hmm. here's the big bang theory. They, people wouldn't even know what you were talking about. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, people want the Bible to be a history book. Do you know when the first history department opened up? We didn't even understand when history was first history department, any university opened up about 200 years ago in Europe. Mm -hmm. That's all. And, but we, but, 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 you know, somehow we think some religious folks think that the, that the Bible is a history book. It is. And I show in five, you know, in, sh in my section five, how I think the Bible should be written. I think that history has, the, the Bible has to be consistent with history. In other words, if you had Fred Flintstone riding a dinosaur, I don't think that would really work. <laughs> mm -hmm. But what I show in, in section five of my book, when I really interrogate the historicity of the Bible, is I think the Bible makes perfect sense for every epoch that it writes about. But I don't think we should read it as a history book either because it, it never thought it was a history book. Mm -hmm. The stories of David are not trying to teach history. They're picked to teach invaluable lessons. Samuel, I mean, again and again, you know, why were these particular stories picked? Not because, you know, uh, you have to, in order to understand the history of World War II, you have to understand all the major battles, but because these are teaching critical components. And I think 
I think religious people missed that. And of course, the first thing that I, the, 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 the notion that we talked about earlier, which is, I think some people, when they set themselves up as a sole spokesperson for God, mm. they fall into a ditch that can be really hard to get out of. Mm-hmm. No, you're absolutely right about that. And, and you mentioned this just, uh, just a few moments ago, too, and, and I want you to unpack it a little bit. Um, but in the book, you do this. You juxtapose idolatry and monotheism, and you, and you pit them against each other as opposites. So I, mm. I want you to un- just unpack that briefly, too, because I think that it's a fascinating concept, too. Right. Well, I think, for better, for worse, people always want to believe in something, which is why I think what I think the danger of atheism is. I think people believe in something, and even atheists end up believing in something when you scratch a little harder and when you have the time to have this kind of conversation with an atheist. It's amazing how they're going to believe in the force of the universe or something. Um, And so... Getting faith right is so important um, and under, not ascribing, you know, super authority to certain people or natural processes like communism. People ascribed communism with truth. How did Mao get 30 million people to march to their death mm-hmm. because they believed? And so, yes, it is at at, 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 at loggerheads with my idolatry is at loggerheads with, um, with, uh, with, um, monotheism. I mean, Stalin, he starved a quarter of the Ukraine. He killed all the kulaks. He sent tens of millions to the gulag and no one stood up as a monotheist should and say, no, we're not going to do this. And if you have enough monotheists, then they, wage battle and they overturn the idolatry. But we didn't do that. And that's just because we're so susceptible. That's why I do think monotheism, in in the absence of monotheism, we get idolatry. We don't get we don't get this, you know, sort of nice atheism um, where everybody's, you know, uh, uh, all happy and holding hands. It just doesn't work out that way. And we see that sadly in the world today, more so than um, my father, you know, you mentioned my father was a Holocaust survivor. I think more so than he could have ever believed. Mm-hmm. So when we talk about this and we, and we, and you're even going through the, the damage, the, the, <laughs> the impact that idolatry has upon people and cultures and society and, um, and especially as we find ourselves, which is kind of ironically enough that we are today is also uh, Amazon Prime Day. Um, that <laughs> we're talking about I- idols, idolatry and stuff and things that we use kind of to define ourselves and things that we uh, that we raise up. Um, aside from because you've mentioned so far that how, how we will idolize certain people, uh, we will we will raise up certain leaders, whether it be religious or political or militarily. What what are what are other what are other aspects that you're seeing idolatry in our culture um, today? What, what are other more like kind of even more quiet or more insidious ones that you see? Well, I do think we have the risk in technology of saying we're just going to trust AI. We're just going to trust the algorithms. You know, uh, I, I talk about this a little bit in the book uh, in the 90s. I was involved with um, a partner um, Uh, my partner, Lou Ranieri, and um, we looked at credit scoring. And as you probably know, credit scoring determines a lot. Mm -hmm. It determines the rate you're going to pay on your mortgage, the rate, you know, how much your insurance is going to cost. People use credit scores for all sorts of things. And now we're finding that there's a whole bunch of companies that use all that they know about you, Stuart, from the people who you have as friends on Facebook to, and by the way, you know, SoFi and others, have you sign away their ability to look at this stuff? Um, so they know who you're, they know who, they know whether your friends are defaulters, not necessarily mm. if you're a defaulter. They'll know do your friends and your, does your circle tend to go to college? They tend to pay their bills. Um, and a whole bunch of stuff that was 
prior unknowable. Now, if you're sitting in a bank, you get something spat out at you, which is called, uh, you know, like a FICO score, another mm -hmm. score. And this is determinate. No one questions a FICO score. Nobody questions it. It just that determines your rate. Mm -hmm. And by the way, if you, you get turned down for credit, by the way, your letter, you know, your form letter gets said back. Well, you got turned down because your FICO score wasn't high enough. I mean, n we, we again park our brains at the door because we um, – we, uh, we, we, we um, travel in, 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 in a world where technology is in question. What worries me is that going forward in the future is that e these technologies, even though they don't, they won't be allowed um, putatively to capture race or sex, perhaps, or um, ethnic background, they will, because AI is so smart, it'll pick that up. So even though it won't know that someone is a first generation African American uh, uh, whose parents didn't go to college, by the social network, by all the, the other things, it'll call it a purple pink person. You know, it won't even know that there's a there's a background. You know, that there's a there's a uh, an ethnicity to it. But it'll in the algorithm capture that idea. And you know what? It's going to be harder for that person to get credit. It's going to be harder for that person to do a lot of things in life. And it's so under the surface because we accept the super authority of technology. We certainly do. If, if there's anything that we bow down to, it's technology today. Mm -hmm. Almost um, in the same way that uh, people did 2,500 years ago. No, we're not – um, bowing down and groveling on our, you know, on our hands and knees, but we're doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and in terms of our actual following the orders of technology, mm -hmm. um, everything from a Google search, um, to, uh, you know, to, to our impacts on credit. So it's insidious. And that's why I think if I can give you just one more example, yeah, cause I yeah. think this is where the Bible people just don't appreciate the, 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 the wisdom of the Bible. So in Genesis 10.5, it says there were many people and many um, lands and many languages. Then chapter 11, there's this thing called the Tower of Bible. And people don't get it. They think it's just, you know, these dumb people built a statue, built, built uh, this a tower to the, to the wall and they a tower to the heavens and they didn't know. They all spoke one language and then they got knocked down and it's a nice little story. It makes no sense. Read the story. And there's only, it's, it's under, it's like 15 lines or so, mm -hmm. 15 verses. But read the story more deeply. What happened? People were living in an area where they had stones and they built houses and stones. So they moved to another area. They moved to a new land, a new epoch. And what did they do? They discovered how to build brick. And they were no longer as tied to nature as they were. Mm -hmm. And then they discovered brick. Then they discovered cement. And then they discovered they could build cities. That's what they started doing. And then you know what? They had these technologies that were new that they didn't understand what they had a vision of building a city. But what did they end up doing? They ended up building a tower. They went in the wrong direction because they believed that that's what they were supposed to be doing. And some tyrant put them all on one platform with one language. The, the Hebrew legend is, or the, is it that was Nimrod. But however, and then they only did have one language. They were only operating on one platform, Facebook, Google, whatever mm -hmm. you want. And they lost track of, of what they were doing and they lost track of the good that these technologies could do and went off in a wrong direction. Mm -hmm. And really what God is doing in the story is restoring the ex ante of many people in many languages that was there in the previous chapter. Mm -hmm. So people read some of these stories, read stories, and they say, oh, it's just, you know, they don't, they don't even pay attention to it. No, you were right about that. And, and, and it seems in many ways through a lot of the stuff that you've mentioned here that we're kind of are in a, we find ourselves in somewhat of a prison um, of idolatry. So what, what, can, what can be done? How can we break free from these types of prisons? It's not easy. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it requires, so for me, and I'm not, I'm speaking very personally, I think prayer is important, mm -hmm. but I think prayer 
in the same way of thinking about, and, and you, you clearly one has to do some study first, thinking about deeply about what monotheism is, thinking about the golden rule. I mean, Hillel said that the entire Bible can be summed up. Don't do unto someone else what would be hateful unto you, if done unto you. Thinking about the golden rule, thinking about how we can make the, the, the Bible clearly gives us each a mission to somehow make this world a better place within our own capabilities. We may have to make some exertion to get to where we need to be to, to exercise those capabilities. But the thing that prayer does for me is, is, is it's not about asking for, you know, a new Corvette. <laughs> it's about intense self-reflection that only one can have with dealing with the master of the universe who can see all and know all and know us in a deeply personal way. Because the issue isn't that I should be like you or you should be like me. It's that we each need to be the best person we can be. And only in, in, self, in self assessment and in talking to a God who we can't lie to, can we get there? And that harsh reflection, that super sharp light that we can put on ourselves maybe says we have to do things that we're not doing. Mm. And, you know, look, when I pray and I, I mean, I think sadly for all of us, I think, I just, I, you know, cause we know each other better than anybody else. We probably cringe at certain things that mm -hmm. we do. And, and I hope prayer makes us say, okay, well, how do we not cringe? How do we do the right thing? How do we place ourselves in the place that, that, that God would want us to be. And if we do that, I have this belief that we get a tailwind in life. Mm. Um, but so breaking free to me is, is, is a lot about prayer. Mm. It's a lot about prayer. And, and that was to me in the five year journey, the thing that changed most intimately about in terms of myself and in terms of the journey is I pray totally differently and and um, more intensely than I did when I started writing the book, because mm -hmm. I realized just how much is at stake mm -hmm. in prayer. It's not just about singing a hymnal. Mm -hmm. Well, I feel like this is this is uh, I I just wanted to even say this to to my listeners out here. This has been a book that I've just slowly started digesting through. For the interview, I had to do a bit of speed reading uh, or speed consumption and. It's one of those ones where I, as I was even speed reading through it, I wanted to go back and say, like, I, I think that I need to let time for this kind of to seep into my bones more. And, and I appreciate the work that you have done. And so, Scott, if they are, if they are looking to find out uh, more about you, more about the book, um, where would you recommend them go? Well, the first thing they should go to is to buy in good faith um, at any quality bookstores and at Amazon as well. And if you want to find some information on the book, you can go to scottshay.com and there's um, some uh, some uh, uh, interviews that I've done. Of course, this interview of course. will be on the web <laughs> website uh, shortly. And there's as well, and this actually came out um, from some demand is that um, we now have study guides for the book mm. for people who want to take it slowly. Um, there are a few churches and synagogues and even a couple of community centers that are using the book and, and using the study guides, which break down um, the concepts of the book. And you can basically just download those if you'd like. Mm. So mm. scottshay.com, um, in good faith. And uh, I, I look forward to extending the conversation. And I do have an email address on the website as well. Oh, that is awesome. Yeah, I found I found mine. It's very easy to find it on Amazon. And again, it's Scott Shea. The book is In Good Faith, Questioning Atheism, Religion, um, and where it seeks to examine the relationship between faith and ethics. So yeah, it does so much, uh, so much within the pages of the book. It is a worthy journey to go on. And I just appreciate, I appreciate uh, your time today, Scott, for being here. And I know my listeners will appreciate being able to, to find the book and go through it as well, too. So thank you. Thank you for your journey and thank you for your time today. It's really a pleasure to be with you. Good things to you, Stuart. Many right. blessings. Thank you. So much thanks to Scott today. You should go 
go over to Amazon, check it out in good faith. Um, it's one thing that I have been, as I said earlier, uh, wrestling through this book and really enjoying kind of the process of wrestling through this. Uh, Scott is just an awesome guy, and I think you may want to wrestle through some of his book with me as well, too. Well, as we end this broadcast, just a reminder that you can catch us on podcast at www.snarkyfaith.com. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, if you have comments, thoughts, questions, want to have a dialogue, want to chat chat with me, questions at snarkyfaith.com. I'm always open. I'm always available. And I always love to talk with people, whether you're critical of me or not. I'll talk to you whether you like me or you hate me. I just like the conversation. Well, as we step away here from the show. It is my duty to send you out into the world with the holiest amount of grace and peace and snark. Go and make a difference in your communities and wherever you live. I'm out of here. I'll catch you guys again next week. Peace! WCOM is listener-supported community radio, and Snarky Faith is only possible through our sponsors. Lumen, a spiritual community of seekers, sojourners, question askers, doubters, and skeptics, is a collective of fellow travelers that embrace the truth that all of life is sacred, hope is real, and tomorrow can be a better day than today. All are welcome. You can find more information at www.lumencommunities.com.